then I can start. We're live, right? A very warm welcome to all our enthusiastic participants from across time zones joining us today. My name is Nirupama and I will be your host for the session. For all our new participants, Five Elements Sustainable Development Group is a consultancy and a collaborative network of institutional and individual partners committed to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Under the mentorship of our chairman, Mr. Arun Amirtam, we are on a mission to foster collaboration and consummate synergies to achieve impact at the nexus of smart cities and affordable housing, renewable energies and smart mobility, essential tech for development, impact finance and leadership development in capacity building. The Gender Justice India webinar series is brought to you by Five Elements SDG, where we bring on thought leaders, entrepreneurs, policy practitioners, and subject matter experts from around the world to engage with and discuss a plethora of issues related to the gender nature of society, polity, culture, and economy. International Women's Day is a global day where we reflect on the progress made on women's rights and celebrate the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. It marks a call to action for accelerating gender equality. International Women's Day remains as relevant as ever given the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on women due to their unique roles in the economy and society. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development reports that before the pandemic, women already faced a 99 year wait before they were expected to enjoy full equality with men. The effects of COVID-19 have increased the wait by almost 40 years to 136, according to estimates by the World Economic Forum. International Women's Day is not about offers and sales for women. It is about breaking gender biases and barriers and working towards their holistic empowerment. Women's rights and needs are to be recognized for us to achieve any of the sustainable development goals. This segues very well into the topic of our webinar this month. Women's employment and their role in the economy, especially in the informal and gig economy, has been much debated and increasingly being recognized as a pertinent area for policymakers and for social intervention. On this note, this month, we are very kindly joined by Dr. Gayatri Nair, Assistant Professor, Social Sciences and Humanities at Indraprastha Institute of Information Technology, Delhi. Gayatri is also a former faculty at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad, and has expertise in the urban informal labor and livelihood patterns with an emphasis on the question of technology, caste, and gender. Gayatri received her MPhil and PhD in sociology from the Center for the Study of Social Systems, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. With a focus on political economy, she has published work examining the links between caste, gender and cultures of modernity, working caste lives, and popular culture. She has published a book on her doctoral research titled Set Adrift, Capitalist Transformations and Community Politics Along Mumbai Shore, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Many congratulations on that achievement, Dr. Gatri. It is an honor to host you, and we are delighted that you're here with us. The floor is yours. Please feel free to share your screen. Thank you so much, uh, Nirpama, Arun, Avni. Uh, you know, it's an absolute uh, delight to be able to given the, be given this opportunity to actually share from my ongoing research. Uh, and of course, on Women's Day, you know, with its history of, um, I mean, I don't know how many people know this, but like Women's Day really begins from uh, the work of Clara Zetkin, a socialist leader who was talking about, uh, you know, the question of work, the question of women's participation in work, questions of class, um, all of which are themes that are quite central uh, in my own research. So I feel happy uh, to be able to actually speak, you know, directly to these kinds of questions. Um, as tragic as it is that it, it continues to remain uh, a question of inequality that uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, what I want to do today is to actually talk about uh, both, you know, of course, uh, the, the theme of the uh, talk is on women's role in the gig economy in India, which is you know, sort of uh, not just in India, but all over the world, uh, the gig economy is being seen as this new sort of site that provides us um, an opportunity to rethink the world of work entirely, right? Uh, and to think about 
the sort of possibilities that it offers um, to those participating in it uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, flexibility, autonomy, features of work that have otherwise sort of remained, um, you know, trapped or, or uh, limited and constrained uh, within typical, um, you know, employee, employ employer, employee relations as we look at it. So the gig economy is really seen as a site of promise and aspiration. Um, and of course, in the context of the development agenda in India as well, there's a particular way in which the question of uh, not just uh, gig work, but women in gig work is perceived and understood. Um, and therefore, what I want to do in this talk is to try and address both these questions, what is really happening to women in the gig economy, uh, but also how are they really navigating uh, these opportunities for empowerment, as it's called, um, because digital platforms see their own role as one in promoting these kind of empowerment opportunities um, for workers, lifting them out of their traps, um, you know, their previous constrained and limited lives. Um, and is this what is actually happening or not is something that I want all of us to consider in this talk. Um, let me just give, get into a little bit of background for those who might not be entirely certain about what gig work is. Uh, so typically when we are referring to a gig, we're referring to short term jobs. Um, you know, we find different kinds of terminologies being used for this zero hour contracts um, are the other kinds of uh, phrases used for gig work, uh, or more typically, we might just know them as freelancers, right? Um, and the assumption here is very much that, um, you know, this is not a, uh, you know, th th this is distinct from our typical imagination of a job, which is much more long term, uh, with much more investments of time, energy, um, skill that might go into it. So gigs are seen as lying on the other spectrum. Um, they're seen as also primarily jobs that are located on um, and contracted through digital platforms. So that's an important distinction from other kinds of work that might also be very short term in nature, that might also not have any kind of lasting relation between the employer and the employee. But specifically, when we're talking about gig work, we're looking at digital platforms that connect uh, consumers with those freelancers providing their services on it. And of course, the platform uh, plays a role as a mediator bringing these two together. Uh, they see their own role as being one uh, of creating labor market efficiencies. Uh, so this is really, you know, I mean, platforms themselves remark in this as being disruptive um, and producing, uh, you know, something, an entirely new paradigm in the world of work. Um, there are distinctions here for us to pay attention to. Um, and particularly so because the number of gig workers across the world are actually rising. Um, we don't have very good estimates for India, um, unfortunately. So the rough estimates that we have, uh, you know, currently stipulate this at about 15 million gig workers. Um, we know through the eShram portal registrations, which have just recently taken off in India, there are about 7 lakh gig workers who have self-registered on the portal. Um, and over the world, uh, over 70 million people are now said to be finding work through digital platforms. Right? So there is, um, I mean, we're clearly at a very, um, you know, critical moment when we think about uh, the world of work, where increasingly larger and larger numbers of people are now turning to digital platforms um, to find work. Uh, and this global rise in platforms, as I said, is, is giving rise to a new form of work because it is rethinking the kind of relationship that one has typically uh, in, in the forms of work. Um, we're looking at digital mediation of work, which produces a certain kind of change uh, in terms of how we think about the nature of the job, uh, how we think about the time that is spent at work, um, and new ways in which services come to be exchanged, right? Uh, where, of course, you know, most of us, uh, those who live in urban cities, are quite familiar with this already, right? Perhaps at the consumer end of it, uh, where we, you know, quickly open a food delivery app and, you know, within half an hour to 40 minutes, you have a hot meal brought to your doorstep by someone. Uh, we might be familiar, uh, you know, in, in terms of hailing like an Uber or an Ola to get from point A to point B. Um, and it's over the last few years that, you know, these forms of services have really become entrenched in our lives. Um, what I want to do is to kind of consider it from the other end, uh, which is to see it from the work, you know, from the perspective of workers um, and try and understand what is really happening um, for workers in gig work. And specifically, of course, for today, speak a little bit about the question of women in gig work and what does it really do to them? 
um, just to understand the context in which women in India are entering gig work, um, it's important to know that India is a bit of an outlier. Um, you know, typically across the world, when we think about development, we know that higher and higher rates of economic growth typically also lead to wider participation from women um, in the labor force. That is more and more women who are employed or who can, you know, seek out paid work. Um, and this is important because, of course, typical gender norms uh, demand that women actually engage primarily in domestic work and unpaid work within the home uh, rather than paid forms of work. Um, so when we are thinking about development, women's labor force participation becomes an important criteria for us to actually consider. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, India stands out in this because India's labor force, female labor force participation rate has actually been declining. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of latest figures um, using CMIE data actually put this at 9.4% uh, between September to December 2021, uh, which is an extremely low figure. Uh, if we were to use different kinds of data sets, that number might rise uh, marginally to, to about 16% or so. But either way, this is uh, remarkably low, and it's one of the lowest rates in the world. It's also much, much lower than other countries in South Asia and in the subcontinent. Uh, so there is something very different, uh, you know, playing out here. Uh, and a lot of feminist um, economists, feminist sociologists have been discussing um, how fe low female participation uh, rate in the labor force also comes down to questions of gender norms, um, particularly around marriage, around reproduction and around domesticity. Uh, so, you know, this context is important for us to remember. Uh, and yet we're seeing, for instance, uh, especially through platforms, uh, uh, a description of kind of bringing women into paid forms of work, lifting them out of these kind of domestic roles and bringing them um, into the formal world of work offered by digital platforms. Um, so what's really going on there? Um, one part of it, uh, one part of this is um, that of course, in urban areas, we might find more women turning to gig work, but typically when we look at labor force participation rates, we know that women tend to be concentrated in agriculture or in informal home-based kind of uh, enterprises. And a, and a significant reason for that comes down again to this question of gender relations and gender norms, um, because women primarily have to work what we you know, uh, refer to as in feminist literature as the double shift. Uh, right, which is that even when women actually engage in paid forms of work, um, you know, they hold down, let's say, a formal nine to five job, uh, they return back home and then undertake a second shift of work, which is of unpaid domestic labor at home. Right. Uh, this contributes, of course, to falling labor force participation rates uh, amongst women, but it also means that typically women are looking for jobs that offer a certain kind of flexibility to be able to navigate this double shift. Because whenever women have to do paid work, typically they are also having to think about how much time is left and remaining in the day for them to devote to care work, to you know, um, taking care of maybe older adults in the household, children, uh, cooking, cleaning, all these other kinds of responsibilities as well. So flexible work you know, across the world and, and from the advent of capitalism, uh, we know that flexible work actually sees a large concentration of women, um, you know, and that is by flexible work, I'm primarily referring to kinds of work which don't have fixed hours, but which, for instance, may offer some kind of flexible time schedules, right, working a couple of hours uh, at one point of time, uh, returning to the home, then, you know, going back and performing paid work again, so on and so forth, right. Um, so we do see women concentrated in these kinds of flexible work, but unfortunately, these also happen to be uh, jobs that we would not consider high quality jobs, right? And that is primarily because they lack uh, a certain amount of regulation around labor conditions, around social security provisioning, um, which means these can be jobs that are very, very poorly paid. We know the gender wage gap remains a significant issue for women. These could be jobs where workers are um, essentially seen as casual workers, uh, our workers who don't have this kind of long-term uh, contract that offers any kind of long-term stability for them. So whenever we're thinking about questions of, you know, uh, not just like, I mean, typically we think about gender wage gap, we think about the glass ceiling, et cetera. It's also 
important to think about the reasons that keep women trapped amongst the lower ends of the occupational hierarchy. Um, and that has to do a lot with the kind of notion of flexibility that is attached to work. Uh, you know, gig work then in, the, in this kind of context, gig work becomes particularly important because gig work is advertised as being, um, you know, something that really offers uh, flexibility and autonomy to workers, right? So of course, I've mentioned, for instance, agriculture and informal, you know, home-based enterprises as forms of flexible work as well. Uh, but those are forms of work that we relegate to the informal economy. We know that they have poor working conditions, um, you know, within them. Gig work, on the other hand, sort of advertise, and when I'm, you know, saying advertise, I primarily mean digital platforms. So think, Uber, Ola, Zomato, Swiggy, Urban Company, et cetera, you know, these platforms advertise themselves as prioritizing flexibility, not for the for serving the interest um, of the employer, or that is the platform, but really bringing about flexibility that is concentrated and works in the interest of workers themselves, right? So the entire idea of gig work, um, you know, rested on the foundation that these are short-term jobs. So you could literally pick the hours that you wanted to work, uh, the kind of work can vary. For instance, we can see across these kinds of platforms, you could be riding a cab, you could be you know, engaged in beauty or spa work. Uh, you could also be engaged in cloud-based work. So that's another kind of gig work. Um, but my research doesn't sort of go into that. So I'm not really going to speak about that. Um, but cloud-based work could be, for instance, undertaking short-term work, you know, taking gigs, uh, for instance, over platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk, for instance, um, you know, just doing basic tasks of maybe, you know, categorizing pictures, looking at some data, writing content, you know, again, there are a wide variety of jobs, but all of this could be broken down into smaller tasks, uh, which becomes the gig, right? And essentially you sign up for whatever you want. Right, and you get paid per gig. So this is seen as being able to combine both flexibility and also autonomy for the worker. They can determine how to do it. There's no boss figure watching you do this work all day. There's nobody monitoring you from nine to five, telling you, you know, um, watching you and seeing whether you're actually being productive or not. There is um, no concept of, you know, a fixed amount of leave. You can work when it when it suits you. You can choose to not work when it doesn't suit you, and no one can sort of, you know, um, remove you from the platform for exercising that flexibility, right? So uh, platforms really see this as a very radical sort of intervention being brought into the world of work. And of course, because this flexibility sort of exists um, in urban areas, particularly amongst women with, you know, certain kinds of skills, um, I'm going to focus on beauty-based workers, we'll see how many of them actually move to gig work. Um, before we sort of get into the discussion of what is happening with um, beauty workers, I'd just like to spend a little bit of time sort of spelling out this difference between gigs and jobs, right? There's a lot of buzz in India right now, for instance, around jobs and job creation. Um, you know, whose responsibility is it? Does the state have to create employment? Um, you know, what are the aspirations of the urban educated youth? Uh, and we know that jobs is an important part of that um, aspiration, right? Uh, but we also notice that there is, for instance, with the rise of gigging, this idea of entrepreneurship, of you know, uh, entrepreneurial um, agency that can actually be brought in, uh, self-employment, you know, these are also increasingly becoming buzzwords. So when we think about gigs and jobs, you know, some of the differences to keep in mind are, of course, that. Typically, when we're talking about jobs, and particularly in light of state policy, uh, we are thinking very much about jobs that lie within the formal economy. Um, that would be jobs that are regulated. Um, you know, they are subject to labor laws, for instance. Um, you know, fixed length of workday, minimum wages assigned, basic social security provisioning, uh, all taken care of. Right. Uh, of course, the counter to that is the informal economy, but gig work operates in this kind of um, you know, middle zone where it where it claims to be a formal enterprise, um, but conditions of work tend more towards informality. Uh, the terms of work in gig work become really important. Uh, the entire model of digital platforms rests on um, 
you know, rethinking the relationship, as I've mentioned, so they don't see it as a relationship between employer and employee. They see it as a relationship between equal stakeholders. So platforms, gig workers and consumers are all seen as equal stakeholders working, you know, or coming together on a platform, right? Uh, but, you know, some of you may be aware of this, that this particular relationship has become uh, very much the site of contestation um, across the world, you have gig workers unionizing, collectivizing, taking digital platforms to court. Um, you know, Uber was taken to court in the US, it was taken to court in the UK, in Netherlands, uh, all to actually get this relationship reclassified as one of employer and employee, which would then require platforms to actually um, you know, take certain kinds of financial um, and legal responsibility for the kind of work conditions uh, workers are subject to, right? Uh, but one of the reasons that platforms give in actually wanting to avoid this classification of employer-employee is because they say that if they do so, it would injure flexibility of work, right? So in some ways, it's pitted as a trade-off between, you know, flexibility and a certain kind of financial, legal, and social security that comes from defining this in a more traditional form as an employer-employee uh, relationship, right? But um, what is actually happening is that increasingly our evidence is pointing to the fact, um, you know, and this is globally, not just in India, but that the conditions of work in the gig economy are not ones where workers actually enjoy flexibility and autonomy. Uh, rather, these are considered to be precarious and insecure forms of work, um, you know, with workers enjoying absolutely no labor rights at all. So they're unable to contest the terms of their work. Uh, you know, they're averaging 12 to 14 hour work days, um, often not even making, um, you know, or, you know, making just about minimum wage, if not, um, and typically not even that. Right. Um, and particularly what is important here is that the burden of risk and responsibility in this arrangement of uh, gig work comes to lie on the worker. So if you're a gig worker who is, um, you know, gone into somebody's home to perform work, um, you know, if something happens to you, right, uh, or if something happens to the customer, the, the liability for that now lies on the worker alone. Right, that's one way to think about it in terms of these kind of safety concerns. But you can also think about it in you know small financial terms of you know when orders get placed, for instance, on food delivery apps and they get cancelled. You know, um, in the in the kind of slip that may happen between these order being orders being placed and cancelled, etc. Who is losing money? Uh, and we find that because workers are termed as partners, right, the financial risk actually lies on them. So the contracts that are signed between workers and platforms are structured in such a way that gig workers are uh, basically taking on the bulk of the risk. They're taking on a bulk of the responsibility, but the financial gains of working on the platform are actually accrued by platforms themselves. Right. So workers are not really finding this to be a sustainable option. Um, for my research, I've been focusing on primarily beauty and spa workers, um, mostly in the Delhi and CR region of India, but also in other pockets of India. Um, and particularly with beauty workers, it's very interesting to see because, you know, unlike, let's say, in food delivery or ride hailing, where um, it is seen as skilled work, of course, you need you need to learn how to drive and you need to know how to navigate uh, using your smartphone, etc. Beauty work really rested heavily on the idea of the skilled woman worker, right? So there was, um, particularly with apps like Urban Company, platforms like Urban Company, they prioritized this notion that they would be bringing skilled and experienced women workers to their platform. They would be sort of drawing them out of the typically small enterprises trapped within the informal economy and providing them a new lease of of life by working on the platform, right? Uh, and this really kind of makes sense, uh, you know, to, to sort of set it in a context, it makes sense for us to see this in light of a development discourse that has been quite popular in India post liberalization, uh, which the scholar Lily Irani actually terms as development as opportunity, right? Where the idea was very much that development is, um, you know, it, it need not just be seen as a sort of 
policy need uh, you know not to be undertaken by the state but it can also be an economic opportunity for profit making and gain right um, and this is a context in which you know instead of jobs the idea emerges that entrepreneurship can be seen as a route to development uh, you know large and micro entrepreneurs uh, are equally vital and should be seen at power at par um, and of course this sounds very nice but when we set it in the context of gig work what it means is that the large entrepreneur uh, of the digital platform so let's say the owners of zomato the owners of urban company are seen as being equal um, you know in state in in position in power to uh, the worker on their platform who is now considered a micro entrepreneur or uh, an independent contractor or a partner coming onto the platform to find their own space for entrepreneurship right so digital platforms um, have become very big in in the conversation around jobs and entrepreneurship in india today uh, many of them you will see you know put out um, publicity material talking about the kind of job creation that they have done not just in india but in a global context right um, and all of that rests very much on this assumption uh, that platforms and workers are at par with one another right um i look at urban company in particular and this is a company that as i've mentioned uh, emerges banking on the skill and experience of beauty workers um, it begins in the delhi ncr region they actually mobilized uh you know from workers from you know small salons uh you know or those employed uh you know in a salaried uh position in larger um you know chain based salons um and they really sort of brought them on to the platform with this idea that they could grow along with the platform that they would be able to use this flexibility right which is of course very tempting for women um because they have these kind of unpaid care work responsibilities as well and they said you can both you know cater to the needs of your home but also grow economically while working with the platform and here the platform is providing you with a formal sort of opportunity right um you know you can see this in in the kind of material they put out for instance this is uh, a very recent tweet put out by urban company where they've been offering stock ownership um, options to uh, gig workers i'll discuss this uh, a little bit towards the end of my talk as well um and you can see the kind of phrasing being used here for the worker right uh, they talk about sita having worked in a salon uh, before but the salon closes down you know she joins urban company her income rises substantially um you know it's even surpassed her previous expectations um she's been able to finance an apartment for herself she's been able to afford her daughter's education so it very much is building on this narrative of empowerment of uh, women through the platform right um however like i said our empirical evidence not just in my research but you know more typically as well in in research that's happening across the world is actually pointing to precarious work conditions so where is this precarity emerging from because you know here we have um you know a the a, a sort of uh, women worker being highlighted as actually earning up to 1 1 and a half lakhs a month which is no small amount in the indian context so where is the precarity uh, that everybody seems to be pointing to um in our own research you know what what we have been coming across is the fact that um you know initial earnings on platforms tend to be very different from what workers begin to sort of earn after a few years on the platform so when you join platforms your incentive pays your hourly pay rates all of these are determined and controlled by the platform so again this sort of you know um, makes us uh, reconsider whether platforms and workers should be seen as equal partners or employer employee relations um, because of the fact that actually the terms of pay are very much set by platforms themselves right uh they decide they decide for instance um that different kinds of pay structures would be involved for different kinds of pay this might look uh at like one amount on um let's say the first month of your work but in the fourth month of your work that pay amount could arbitrarily change and this is often done without any consideration or without any consultation with workers themselves on the platform right um and when early work rates change when incentive pay rates change because this is flexible work that is you can decide how much you want to earn by working 
you know, deciding the length of time you want to spend on the platform, uh, when the rates per hour decline or when incentive rates decline, workers are compelled to actually work longer and longer hours on the platform. So, you know, 12 to 14 hour workdays uh, are pretty common. Um, amongst beauty workers, uh, this could be around eight to 10 hours, right, of work, but the pay remains poor. So even though you're now working longer, you might in fact be earning much lesser than what you were earning when you first started out with the platform. There's also a great amount of divergence between what one worker and another worker gets. Workers are routinely put into different kinds of categories, different kinds of expectations are tied in uh, to these categories about the length of time that they must give to each kind of gig that they get, the kind of products, for instance, that beauty workers must use. All of that changes, um, you know, and all of it begins to impact their pay. So you will be hard pressed to find two workers who might have an identical length of the working day, but will have very different payouts at the end of it, right? Um, now, this story of, you know, this narrative of, of declining incomes and longer hours of work remains common across all kinds of gig work. So food delivery, you know, ride hailing or beauty work, this kind of remains common. Um, but what I thought we could, you know, speak about, what I could speak about a little bit today is also the gender specific sort of outcomes that emerge. Uh, from this kind of work, right? Um, there has been research by uh, the Center for Internet and Society, for instance, that talks about women workers uh, in food delivery, right? And how they get automatically logged out of the app by six o'clock in the evening. So even if women workers want to work longer, the app just, this, just sort of prevents them from doing so, um, which ultimately then again affects their, um, their earnings for a day, week, month, so on and so forth. Right. Uh, so this is not even though poor work, uh, poor working conditions exist, women workers are being affected in a specific kind of way. Right. Uh, safety remains a very big concern with women workers in particular. Um, and this is particularly the case within beauty work where workers are actually going into the site of the home. Uh, they're entering somebody's private space. And of course, there are sort of measures that have been introduced. For instance, urban company asks that uh, only women may book women's services. Uh, you know, workers are told to make a call and make sure that they speak to a woman before they enter the house. Um, you know, so all these measures exist. There are also technology-based interventions that are there. So there's an SOS app that workers can press. Um, and yet workers are actually, when we think about it and when, you, when we talk to workers, we find that they are navigating an immense amount of risk when they engage in this kind of work, right? Going into somebody's house, um, into somebody's private space. Um, you know, there is a fear of uh, sexual harassment, um, there have been cases where, when, you know, some of our respondents have reported even feeling harassed at the hands of um, other women, right? Uh, there are ways in which class and caste differences are constantly articulated um, on the bodies of women workers, particularly under COVID, for instance, they are always seen as people who are, you know, carriers of COVID, um, you know, they're sprayed down and literally uh, with sanitizer, you know, workers have told us about how in the peak of winter in Delhi, they, their clothes are being made wet by customers who kind of hose them down with sanitizer before letting them into the house. So we know that women workers are, are sort of working at the intersection of caste, class and gender. There are particular kinds of impacts that women workers are um, facing, right? Um, and therefore, the kind of responses that have come out from women workers is also very different, right? Another very big issue that women workers actually have to deal with is about the question of the respectability of work that they do. So we know that, you know, engaging in paid work itself is an uphill task, given the kind of, um, you know, patriarchal uh, structures and norms we have um, in India. Families therefore need to be convinced of doing this kind of work, but particularly when they're working in a platform, right? Not working in a salon where customers may come in, but actually going into the house of customers. Women have to spend a lot of time convincing family members about the respectability of this kind of work that they do, right? And these are things that, for instance, even though men in gig work are experiencing precarity, uh, these concerns around respectability operate very, very differently from male workers as they do for female workers. 
Um, what's interesting is in our uh, you know interviews, workers are also pointing to how platforms also make you know mention that respectability of going into the home of a consumer to perform work comes only by working through platforms. So when you know women try to bypass platforms, for instance, and you know maybe find clients who they get to know on a personal basis, whose houses houses they can visit, um, you know they're often receiving negative feedback then from the platform itself which tells them um that you know you are you're not fit for the kind of empowerment we imagine you're going to be stuck in low rung work in non-respectable work because true respectability is and true empowerment is tied to working on the app right um so these are some of the narratives that are pointing to the fact that actually it's not flexibility and autonomy but rather precarity and insecurity that we find um, taking place for workers. In the case of women workers, in particular, we have seen uh, amongst the beauty sector an impoverishment of workers happening. Um, there have been two recent agitations that have happened in October and December 2021 in the Delhi and CR region. Um, and a number of demands were sort of put up by women workers. This is also interestingly one of the largest um, you know, forms of collective action by women gig workers that we have seen um, in India so far. Uh, and in all of this, <clears throat> workers were pointing to their increasingly impoverished and precarious conditions, right? They were pointing to the fact that they were being denied flexibility by platforms because platforms were mandating the days on which they must work. They were mandating the hours on which they were working. And <clears throat> particularly, as I mentioned, for women, this has a significant impact because if the length of the workday increases, it also means their double shift of work, which you know means uh, the unpaid and um, care work and domestic work that they're undertaking um, also sort of you know suffers an impact, and it also kind of really expands the length of their workday. Right? Uh, women workers also point to the fact that the algorithmic control that they're subject to to platforms tends to be very very severe. Um, there is a lot of emphasis for women workers on comportment, on the ways in which they carry themselves, you know, a specific form of grooming that is demanded of them, uh, you know, the way they keep their hair, the way they dress, the, the way their makeup must stay on um, throughout the workday, which doesn't take into consideration the fact that women are physically moving from site to site of work, um, you know, under, and of course, uh, undertaking a very long work day, right? But they are repeatedly told to pay attention to these factors because the platforms design the algorithms of these applications in such a way that you are rating, when you are rating, um, you know, workers who do this work for you, part of, you know, this comportment becomes part of it. So the way in which you appear to the consumer becomes part of your work performance as well. So it doesn't matter how good a job you do of giving them a haircut or a massage or a facial, <clears throat> the, your own appearance right, takes on an additional kind of value. And there is a lot of literature, for instance, talking about how women are pushed into these kinds of roles that must, um, that entail this kind of emotional labor that is, you know, uh, over and above the kind of work that they otherwise have to perform as well. Um, women workers are also working uncompensated on platforms. So when they receive low ratings, for instance, uh, they must undergo training periods compulsorily. They are logging into platforms for this training. Um, it's a part of their workday, but they lose income. So off late, a lot of the pandemic, and particularly this has happened in the context of the pandemic, a lot of the policies of platforms have pushed workers into this condition of impoverishment, and particularly because of the ways in which algorithmic control and management is um, operated upon workers, where ratings become so important um, as a way to determine whether they can continue on the platform or not, they are also unable to you know, contest the behavior of consumers. What I'm essentially therefore just trying to point out to is that you know, this kind of equal relationship that was being drawn between platforms, consumers, and workers in practice doesn't end up being an equal relationship at all, right? Because platforms um, are controlling uh, and determining the amount workers um, earn and the amount workers work. Consumers have, for instance, these kind of rating systems in their hand. You know, many of us do these ratings. We may not think it has much of an effect, 
um, but actually there are severe penalties attached to it. So anything less than, you know, um, uh, for instance, on, on platform, you know, on UC uh, urban company platforms, for instance, um, you require an extremely high rating, 4.7 and higher to, to be considered a good worker, anything below that, right? Uh, and you are categorized as a poor worker, you are um, sent in for retraining, you know, so on and so forth. So the pressures on the worker are absolutely immense. Um, and the freedom, autonomy, flexibility that was promised um, does not actually exist, right? And this is one of the reasons why we are seeing increasingly women workers coming out. And I think it's interesting that women workers are at the forefront of many of these agitations because the flexibility question is something that really injures their interests, right? Of course, we would like to see a more equitable division of domestic uh, and care work responsibilities within the home, right? And of course, that would mean that women are able to participate um, in a more meaningful and substantive way in paid work. But so long as that is not the case, women are actually being penalized both with unpaid work as well as in paid work um, because you know, the, the structures of uh, digital platforms do not accommodate the needs of women. And of course, patriarchal norms and structures at home have not opened up to accommodate um, you know, an equal division of labor within the site of the home. You know, so just as final thoughts, what, what do we see as the path ahead? Um, you know, I've sh showed you that image previously of urban company, for instance, now offering stock sharing options, right, for, uh, for work workers. It's not just for women workers. It's also for male workers on the platform. Um, this is being seen and hailed as being a substantially, uh, you know, positive move uh, because it actually you know, perhaps is the first step towards really considering workers as equal partners if they actually get stock sharing options, uh, something that was not present for all these years. Um, but what is important to note here is that it is tied to a question of merit. So if you looked at that image, um, I don't know how many of you might have seen it, it also mentioned Sita's worker rating, right? Which means that again, the rating, which is very much determined by platforms and consumers, becomes the way to determine who is seen as meritorious enough to receive these stock sharing options and perhaps take on a more meaningful role, but certainly not an equal role uh, to the platform. So, you know, while it is in a, a, an interesting and positive move, one must weigh it against the fact um, that the conditions for, for you know, uh, for accessing uh, these kinds of equal partnership opportunities and truly empowering opportunities are again out, lie outside of uh, the hands of workers themselves, right? Uh, because ratings actually play such a significant role, workers are forced to be docile and, and compliant. So if we really want to see um, an equal partnership, we need to see a different way in which ratings actually operate. Uh, we need to rethink uh, the relationship between workers and platforms. And that need not be in the root of thinking of them as workers. We can also think, uh, and, and you know, gig workers around the world have shown us the path in this, in just simply classifying it and returning it to a traditional category of employer employees, uh, because there are legal provisions tied into that categorization. Um, and if it offers an opportunity for workers to actually enjoy more security in work, then perhaps what we don't, we don't need the novelty of, um, of you know, independent contractors all coming together on a digital platform. Perhaps what would be better was, would be to return to a traditional employer-employee kind of understanding in place. Um, having said that, given that there is a real aspiration and need, uh, particularly amongst women workers, to find this flexibility and autonomy in paid work, it would be important that a future idea or a future model of platform work or uh, you know, actually incorporate this flexibility and autonomy for women workers. We certainly want to see higher and higher number of women uh, engaging in paid forms of work, right? Um, but this has to be good quality jobs. And for that to happen, flexibility and autonomy is important. So what I'm suggesting is a sort of restructuring of the platform model itself, uh, where employer-employee relationships can be held, 
but they also come with flexibility and autonomy and we of course you know we have already a model for this in many forms of formal employment where workers are given flexible work options where they are given uh, autonomy in determining their work day and thinking about how processes and um, you know output have to be sort of uh, delivered so the model already exists we just need to think about how to apply it uh, to the platform model itself and of course, all of this rests on a foundation uh, of labor regulation. Uh, you know, we need to definitely intervene in, in uh, gig work to determine what would be a reasonable length of the workday, what would be minimum wage conditions. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a part of the economy that has completely escaped this kind of regulation. Um, there has been a recent attempt to introduce social security provisioning into gig work in India. Uh, there was a social security code that was introduced in 2020. It is, however, yet to be implemented. Uh, there is currently a court case that has been filed by a gig worker collective in India asking for implementation of this. And very interestingly, and I'll, I'll sort, I'll sort of stop with this, uh, that case basically asks for either gig workers to be recognized um, you know, within the law so that this kind of regulation can operate or to be returned to the category of unorganized workers, because at least under the law, there is a certain amount of provisioning that exists for unorganized workers. Gig workers, unfortunately, you know, exist in this kind of nebulous gray zone where they are neither formal workers nor informal workers. They lie in between. Um, and while it was all supposed to work for their benefit, um, it has unfortunately worked to their detriment. So women workers are parts of these agitations, these collectives, these associations that are, that are demanding a reconsideration of all this. And I think the path ahead really lies in turning to them and, and seeing how they um, suggest new models and new routes for us to take. I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaisri, for that very insightful presentation. Uh, it really helped us to understand the gig economy and especially women's role in this, as it's a very upcoming uh, development. So uh, I will begin with the Q&A session. Um, just to humbly reiterate, I shall be reading comments and queries from the chat box. In case you wish to ask your question verbally, kindly raise your hands before unmuting. Please keep questions brief and to the point. Any more queries following the session can be mailed to us at 5elements.sdg at gmail.com. For some questions. Uh, so while the questions come in, uh, Kathy, I had one question. Uh, so there are some people who say that uh, in order to increase the female labor force participation, we should uh, incorporate flexibilities in the working structure of organizations. But in a way, that is a very like a band-aid kind of an approach because it doesn't uh, really, uh, you know, challenge the uh, gender roles within the home. It is still expected that the woman has to go back and cater to her household responsibility. And that is why we can incorporate flexibility in the organization. So what are your thoughts about that? So, I mean, I think, um, uh, let me try and answer that at two levels. One is, I think, for all workers, men or women, uh, when we think of the world of work, flexibility is something that we, would, we should actually aim for, right? And I think part of the reason the struggle for flexibility becomes important, even for gender norms, right, is because if we were to... Th to actually put in place, you know, real flexibility that works in the interest of workers, it also enables, uh, for instance, men to participate more in domestic work, right? For men to be not seen as, as primarily associated with their economic roles outside of the home, but also to be able to think about, um, you know, balancing and actually not just being lip service to work-life balance, but to actually think of, you know, your home and care work as being um, equivalent to the kind of paid work that you do, right? The other is that we should never think of this as a one-stop, you know, policy uh, measure, right? We can't, you are absolutely right that if we simply throw our weight behind flexibility for women workers, right? Uh, we are never going to be able to pose a challenge to the gender norms that actually exist. What we need are multi-pronged sort of strategies uh, in terms of policy, in terms of, um, you know, activism in terms of consciousness, in terms of um, 
people participating in, in movements and conversations to actually make sure that uh, we are challenging these kind of existing gender norms that demand a, a double shift from women uh, instead of thinking about more equitable measures, uh, equitable divisions of labor within the household. So um, it, yeah, it would be important to think of this in, in a certain kind of context where women are anyway being limited, right? Uh, but at the same time, how can we actually also sort of, you know, attack this issue from other ends as well? Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, I think Shama has a question. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Um, it's been wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. It's, it's been good to listen to you because this is definitely an area where there are more questions than answers. Um, so thank you for this guide through it. Okay, Gayatri, have you uh, done any study or can you cite any study where parity, pay parity has been uh, documented between male and female gig workers? Because it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're on the computer, it really doesn't matter whether you're male or female. So um, that is one, you know, I, my, uh, the first part of my question. The second is, isn't it easier, in fact, to regulate uh, isn't it just easier to regulate because there is an aggregator involved and there is a platform and there is documentation where everything down to the Aadhaar card and bank account is being recorded by the aggregator. So therefore, uh, issues like uh, minimum pay per hour or number of hours limiting, you know, which, which one sees all over the world, isn't it possible that that can be championed into this space? into the online space because aggregators are visible as contractors. In the informal space, it's very difficult, you know, to uh, identify who the contractor is. Here, yeah, it's up there and on the record. So the, there are two parts to my question, please. Thanks, uh, Shama, for that question. Um, the, let me answer, uh, you know, in order. The first about pay parity, right? Uh, so the the thing about gig work is that actually, I mean, um, you know, one if we were to consider the amount of time that women are actually able to devote, for instance, um, you know, to paid work, we we'll of course notice a kind of distinction in pay parity that happens right there, right? The the deeper problem though is um, not about a distinction actually between men and women and pay parity between men and women, but the fact that it is so subjective and differs from worker to worker. Right. So you and I may have joined the platform at absolutely the same time. Right. Uh, we might have begun with the same kind of pay structures being given out to us. But in a month, we could be actually operating on very different pay structures. So it doesn't matter whether, you know, we're working the same number of uh, we could be working the same number of hours. There could be a distinction between our pace. There could be the distinction between pays of uh, men and women. So the, the this also sort of atomizes workers. Right. So it also becomes very difficult for actually workers to really come together because of the fact that there is no uniformity in how gig work really operates. So the entire I, the model of uh, platform work really rests on, you know, as they call it, individual flexibility and autonomy, but as workers experience it, an extreme form of atomization, which leaves them unable to sort of, you know, it makes it difficult. Let me not say unable because we've been witness to many worker resistances uh, over the last few years in particular. But it makes it very, very difficult for workers to kind of contest this, to even make a note of, you know, what are average, uh, what is the average pay, for instance, becomes very, very difficult to calculate, given this kind of extreme difference at a granular level, right? So uh, that's, that's the reason why pay parity questions um, don't really, make, you know, emerge very strongly in gig work, though what, what becomes important is therefore then, you know, does the platform enable you to work on it in the same way that, for instance, it does for a male worker? So like I said, the Center for Internet and Society's report on uh, women in food delivery notes, for instance, that women 
are prevented from working um, you know beyond 6 pm in the evening on food delivery apps um, in, in particular cities which means that obviously their pay is going to now be lesser compared to men uh, you know who uh, who can of course continue after 6 pm 7 pm being also surge time you know a, a peak period on these kind of apps right um, so there are gender based distinctions but there is also this question of extreme atomization of the worker um your second question about regulation being possible of course it's a possibility uh, the point is um there is little will political will for instance that exists in this kind of um, you know uh, regulation uh, and that's not just down to particular kind of governments this is a global kind of consideration right uh, there is uh, an extreme re reluctance to kind of come down on platform work and actually regulate platform work um, more closely um, some countries have done it so uk has done it netherlands has done it it has been moving in that direction uh, but it's not really taken off everywhere because the political will for that doesn't really exist because platforms are seen as bringing in capital they're seen as being job creators um and you know the the idea and the, the model rests so heavily including financially um on this idea that uh, these the relationship between um workers and the platform be considered as a partnership and not as an employer employee relationship um that you are you know not going to necessarily see any strong willingness happening uh from either the end of the platform or typically from states in pushing for this kind of regulation where regulation has happened it has been worker led uh, typically by filing cases uh, which they have won and that has led to this kind of intervention and regulation um so it's not an absence of information it's not the uh, it's not a, a, you know it's not that you know there is an inability to do so uh, it is a willingness that is actually kind of missing from the picture I thank you for that yeah thank you for that uh, do we have any other questions otherwise uh, we can close as the time is almost any further questions can be emailed to us and we will uh, send it forward to dr gayatri uh, so with this we come to the end of our webinar women in the gig economy it is a privilege to present the vote of thanks on behalf of my entire team here at five elements thank you dr gayatri for taking time out of your busy schedule to enlighten us about women's role in the gig economy and how we can understand these complexities better We are also very grateful to our enthusiastic participants for their curiosity and enthusiasm in making this a unique learning experience. I would also like to remind our audience that we have completed one year of the Gender Justice India webinar series. We would love to hear your feedback and experience with Gender Justice India. Please do drop in your email in the chat box, and we shall get in touch with you shortly with a brief survey. If you are on our mailing list already, please do expect to hear from us soon. Thank you. please come back next month as we explore yet another issue through the lens of gender justice please feel free to write to us at fiveelements.sdg@gmail.com thank you stay safe out there and good bye thank you everyone thank you so much dr gayatri thank you gayatri thank you nirupama bye thank you thank you thank you take care